Good afternoon, and welcome to this talk about tracking vulnerabilities with Buildroot and Yocto. Um, I will first say a bit about myself. My name is Arnoud. Um, I'm an embedded software architect, but that's just a title. Um, so I work in embedded software as a consultant, um, uh, focusing on Linux operating system integration, so the, the lower levels of the operating system, which includes some kernel work, but mostly uh, integration work, packaging, things like that. Um, and as a consultant, I've worked for many different customers in all kinds of domains, uh, multimedia security, home automation, satellite communications, uh, satellite um, GPS, uh, telecommunications, um, Bluetooth, uh, and I'm probably forgetting some domains as well. Um, also, I'm a maintainer of the BuildRoot project, which explains why I talk about BuildRoot in this talk. Uh, but for my customers, I also work with Yocto quite often. Um, so I can talk about both here. Um, so what am I going to talk about? Um, first, uh, as an introduction, why do we track vulnerabilities to begin with? I hope I don't have to spend too much time on that. Um, and then about the infrastructure that exists in the world uh, for tracking vulnerabilities, basically CVEs. Then how it's done in build routes, how it's done in Yocto. I'm starting with build route because that's what I know best. Um, so the Yocto part is going to be a little less in depth. And then finally, an alternative, which is uh, tracking vulnerabilities with a, a, a software bill of materials. Um, and then finally, some evaluation. Well, actually, the evaluation is uh, during all the rest as well. So why track? track vulnerabilities. Is there anybody who feels that I should even discuss this? I think I put some reasons in there, but I think for most people it's obvious that we need to be aware at least of which vulnerabilities exist in the products that we make. Although what I see my customers is that it's not done that cons conscientiously. Um, I expect that uh, this is going to become more and more important. Um, so on the one hand, we have, uh, because the devices are getting more connected, we will see more attacks and they will eventually hurt sales. And then, then suddenly it's important, of course. Um, and on the other hand, we also have um, regulations coming up. So in uh, the EU is, is discussing regulations uh, that, among other things, uh, also require products to be, um, to some extent, secure. Um, now, the, what is, what is um, important is that we want tracking, uh, we, we want to track vulnerabilities after the product is, has been sold already, um, to be able to fix things after the fact. Um, so it's not just at the time that we build the product, it's also afterwards that they need to be tracked. Um, it's also important to realize, and this is a slide I stole from a presentation this morning, <laughs> that uh, so SecComp is one piece of the uh, security jigsaw, but also uh, tracking vulnerabilities is one piece. It's this piece here. So it's a very small piece of the whole, but a necessary piece. So how can we track these vulnerabilities? The first thing we need is a way to be aware of vulnerabilities. Um, one way to do that would be to do constant audits of all the open source and closed source software that you integrate in your product, um, but that is not feasible. <coughs> um, and because everybody in the world has this problem, um, a, a kind of solution has been created uh, in early uh, this millennium, um, which is called the common vulnerabilities and exposures. Um, so CVE is, a, is, is basically a system for identifying vulnerabilities. It's basically an, uh, it's not mu much more than, than an ID, than a, a, a number. Um, so that's the main purpose of the CVE. And then there's the database of vulnerabilities. In fact, there are several databases of uh, um, CVEs. The most uh, central one, let's say, uh, is the NVD, the National Vulnerability Database, uh, which is maintained by uh, a US government institute called NIST. Um, 
so they provide a server uh, which uh, provides access to this database. Um, they also, uh, you can send a mail to them to say that there is something wrong in their database and it needs to be updated. Um, but it's not the only database, so there are other databases of, um, of, of all the vulnerabilities, but there are also many uh, more specialized databases. For instance, all the big distros have their own databases of CVEs, um, which are uh, typically copied from, from the uh, NVD data, database, but only the ones that apply to them, so which are uh, so any, anything Windows only is not going to appear in that database. Uh, now with the CVE, you have an identifier of, of a vulnerability um, and then there is some free text description of what this vulnerability is, but not really much more than that. Um, it doesn't allow you to identify what is the thing that is vulnerable. Um, and so uh, it, it started with a, a bit more formal description of how uh, the, the contents of the CVE should be structured. Uh, but in, I think something like 15 years ago, a more formal uh, definition has been made and that is the CPE, the Common Platform Enumeration, um, which uh, they have different terminology, but basically which allows you to identify a package. Um, and not just a package, also a version of that package. Um, so the way it works is that a, a, a CPE is a number, but a more structured number um, with a bit of a header. They're already at version 2.3 because it's already from quite some time ago. Um, and then you have a vendor and products um, in a version. And then there's some more fields which are basically never used. Um, and so there is also a database of all these products and all these versions that exist or for which CVEs exist. And uh, this database is uh, maintained by NIST as well. Um, so also to that database, you have web access and, and um, uh, command line access. Um, and so these two are linked with each other. So uh, every... Um, CVE has a list of CVEs to which it applies. The original idea was that uh, every time a vendor releases software, they also create a CPE entry. And so that entry is added in the database. And then when um, a CVE is uh, created, uh, they enumerate all the, the versions to which it applies. Um, it turned out that that didn't work very well. So eventually they came up, came up with also a way to specify a range of uh, uh, of versions, basically larger than and smaller than. Um, and then you can have several uh, CPE entries to which the CVE applies. I have examples uh, a bit later. Um, unfortunately, the, this CPE thing does not work that great. Um, most of the reasons that it doesn't work is actually because it's from a time before open source software was, was really popular. And so it's not really um, applies well to the open source software of, of, of today. Um, so one issue is that software packages sometimes don't, don't even have releases. So you just have to leave it hat and, and take some random uh, git commit. Um, and there is simply no way to track that in, in the CPE database. Uh, the, the version comparison simply doesn't work. Um, it also doesn't take into account patch versions. So in theory, if you have the uh, like OpenSSL, the upstream version, uh, and then the one patched by Debian and the one patched by Red Hat and so on and so on, um, there should be separate CPE entries for all of those. But nobody does that, so you basically have one CPE entry and you don't know if, if a specific package that you have, if that CPE entry applies to it or not. Um, it's also a bit cumbersome to create them, so in theory you have to every release create uh, a new CPE entry. And um, the worst thing is that there is no link to the actual software, so it's just an identifier again, um, which for... for um, the closed source uh, world was logical because you, you didn't have a Git repository to point to. Uh, but for us, we want to actually link it to 
a, a release tarball or a Git repository or something physical, you know, well, not physical, but something we can touch. Um, and the CPE doesn't provide that. Um, and in addition, the information in the CVE database is often incorrect. Fortunately, it's fairly easy to correct it, so uh, you can't make a pull request, but at least you have a contact form where you can fill in the reasons why the CPE information is not correct, and usually within a day or two, they will fix it then. So here's an example of uh, what the CPE looks like in for a real CVE and uh, why it's uh, not correct. Um, so the um, here is a list of the CPE IDs to which it applies. Um, so we have several uh, configurations and then in configuration two, we have two versions to which it applies. Um, and all of them are wrong actually. Um, <laughs> so first we see here that in the descrip description it says before 2.28.0 and uh, before 3.0. But then in the, uh, here it says from 2.22.0 up to 3.1.0. So the before uh, 2.28.0 is completely dropped from this range. So if you have a 2.28.0, um, it will in fact match that, that uh, CPE entry. And so you think that you're your software is vulnerable, while well, actually it is not. The reason that this happens is because um, at the time that the CPE entry was added, uh, 2.28.0 didn't exist yet, and nobody thought of updating it afterwards. Um, and then the, the, the Fedora thing is also wrong, because in fact uh, this, this issue was fixed both in Fedora 36 and 37. Um, so the, the 36 and 37 doesn't say whether this is Fedora 36 at the time of first release or with all security patches applied. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of useless information as well. Still, it's the best that we have. Um, so we will we will use it uh, in um, in build root any octo. So let's take a look at how it actually works uh, in build roots. The command to uh, track vulnerabilities is very intuitively called make package stats. Um, the reason it's called that is because it's a bit historical. There was a package stats command already. And then somebody said, yeah, I also want to do CVE tracking. And uh, yeah, we can easily add it there. And so package stats got extended with, with um, CVE tracking. What does this command do? Well, it doesn't actually do it in make. It calls a, a Python helper to do the actual heavy lifting. Uh, it will download the CVE and CPE database as JSON files and just save those JSON files as disk. And those are cached for 24 hours uh, because the downloading all of that takes a couple of minutes. So it's uh, useful to cache it. Unfortunately, there is no way in the uh, in the MVD database to ask for everything that changed since yesterday. So there, the only way to update the cache is to download everything again. Um, and, and unfortunately, also things can change even in very old CVEs because maybe the CPE entry has been updated. Uh, so yeah, you can't just say I, I only download the ones from 2023. No, you also have to download 2009 again. Um, second, the uh, selected packages, so the packages that are uh, selected in the configuration file of BuildRoot um, are cross-referenced with the CPE database uh, to, to see which versions match. Um, and then these are uh, Sorry. These are referenced in the CV, CVE database um, to see which CVEs apply to them. And then finally, some exclusions are applied to it. I'll come back to that, why that is. And uh, the result is written to JSON and to HTML. The HTML, I can make a demo. <laughs> there is my demo. So there's the HTML output. Um, it's not important that it's not readable. 
uh, I'll just say you have the package name what you need then is a version number and then here is all the CVE information here is the CPE identifier which is uh, determined by build roots if it's uh, green it means it's a valid identifier it exists in the, in the CPE database if it's red there is something wrong with it um, so in this case there is no corresponding identifier in the top case uh, the uh, Linux Linux kernel identifier does exist but the version number doesn't exist um, in in this nice interface with JavaScript we can actually sort on CVEs to find all the packages which have some CVE applied to them otherwise this HTML is not actually very useful so it's good for showing in a presentation but and, and also for manually looking at it but if you want to formally do it you you will need to use the JSON files and I'll come back to that um, so uh, yeah, I went over this and then the exclusions yeah, I didn't mention exclusions yet so one column is also the exclusions which have been applied um, so the the, uh, the box in orange is the list of CVEs which apply to that version and which have not been excluded the exclusions uh, they are added for various reasons the most important one is because build root carries a patch that fixes that CVE um, but it can also be to due to other things like uh, the issue doesn't exist in build root because for instance like the OpenSSL random number generator issue that was in Debian um, that's an OpenSSL issue but it only applies to Debian so then we make an exclusion for that one um, or the vulnerable code is never even built in build root for instance in um, some packages uh, I can't think of anyone immediately but have several packages which are in a single uh, um, which are in under a single product uh, so in the in the CVE database but build root only uses a part of it um, and so then only that well, well anything which which applies to the rest is not included and now it's nice to have this list of CVEs but it has a bunch of limitations uh, to when you want to use it in practice and all these limitations uh, actually uh, come from the fact that this was created more for the maintainers to see okay we have to update build root and, and uh, apply uh, patches to, to fix these CVEs not so much for vulnerability tracking by a user um, so what are the limitations uh, one limitation is that you have to explicitly do make package stats but okay that's not much of a problem uh, so it's not always there you have to explicitly ask for it um, we can't really do it always because downloading the database takes quite some time so um, also the, the information reported does not contain the uh, CVSS analysis the severity analysis um, now my opinion that analysis is usually geared more towards like cloud applications and for your typical embedded application or when you use build roots it's not so relevant you have to anyway uh, re-evaluate for yourself what uh, what the severity is um, more importantly you need a full build root source to generate the vulnerability list so you can't uh, once you've made a build um, the the build artifact does not contain the information that you need to regenerate the CVE list and you will need to regenerate the CVE list after the product has been released so that means if you afterwards want to um, to to check are there any new CVEs that have have been uh, created which apply to my product <coughs> then you will need a full build root source again you don't need to do a full build you just need all the sources um, that includes the uh, package definition custom package definitions but actually only if you want to check CVEs for door for those if you don't want that then you can just leave those out but well it's not, not a big deal to include them as well um, there's no separation of built only packages which means if you use for instance OpenSSL during the build to sign the kernel then uh, 
this is also the vulnerabilities to OpenSSL are also included, even if you don't have OpenSSL in your target device. So it looks at first sight, yeah, but then maybe we should leave out OpenSSL. On the other hand, it's very well possible that the vulnerability still applies to the signing of the kernel. So it's maybe not so bad that, that even those built-only packages are included. Um, but then if you want to maintain that CVE list later, um, you will do an analysis of each CVE and in many cases you will determine, okay, this CVE actually does not apply to my product. Um, for instance, uh, there is a vulnerability in some encryption algorithm that is not used in my product. Or there is a, a vulnerability that uh, only applies in a certain configuration and in my configuration it's configured differently so it doesn't apply. Um, so it's not possible to, uh, to add these exclusions later without modifying the source. But for a release, you don't want to modify your tagged release after the fact. So that's a bit a, a tricky uh, case. Also, there's no way to, uh, or it's difficult to record configuration specific ex exclusions. But so it's still possible to use it in practice. And how do you do that? Um, you uh, set up your CI to not only do builds, but also generate the vulnerability info. And then you just ignore that vulnerability info. Um, at the time that you're preparing a release, uh, then you're going to evaluate the vulnerabilities and if necessary, patch them. Uh, but uh, for many cases, you will just document, okay, this has been evaluated as not applicable or it has been available, uh, evaluated as uh, low severity. Um, so only if there's really something that needs to be patched, you, you do the patching. And then after the release, you regularly regenerate the vulnerability info um, on, the, uh, on the released source code. So you, you tag your release and then you make sure that there's a weekly, for instance, uh, CI job that runs on that release tag to generate the vulnerability info. And then you sometimes have to check, okay, what's, what are the difference between the last time I checked? Are there any new CVEs? Um, and then update this manual document, uh, manually update this document to see what is, um, well, to, to evaluate the new issues. Now, in Yocto. In Yocto, it's actually quite similar. Uh, so the technical aspects differ a little, but it uses the same approach of querying the MVD database. Um, so uh, uh, you, you do the CVE check by just adding inherit CVE check to, um, to your configuration file. And then you typically also do include ex uh, CVE extra exclusions, uh, extra exclusions. Um, that's for this, the CVE exclusions that Builtroot also has. has in Yocto, there are, most of them are put in a separate file. And so what does Yocto do then? It's uh, also done as a CVE database, but not a CPE database. And then it uh, goes to, uh, it looks at the CVE product defined in a recipe and looks, looks up everything in a CVE database that uh, matches it. So it doesn't look at version at all. It only looks at the product. Um, and then uh, after it has collected all of this, then it goes to each uh, CVE and checks the version um, with, with uh, greater than, smaller than matching. Um, and if the version doesn't match, then uh, it says, okay, it's already patched. Or if there is a patch file in Yocto itself, then it says it's already patched. Um, and you can also specify explicit exclusions, uh, like in that uh, extra exclusions database, um, and uh, then it's marked as ignored. And so you have a, the result is a per package JSON file with uh, all the CVEs that apply to the package at, in any version, and then for each CVE, whether it's patched or ignored or uh, vulnerable. So you always need, need post-processing to, to use this. There's also a text file, but it's useless because the JSON is easier to post-process. Uh, so here is an example of what it looks like. Don't worry too much about the details. Uh, it's basically, it basically contains all the information that I mentioned. Uh, it also includes the um, uh, CCVS, CVVS, I forgot <laughs> the abbreviation, the, the, um, 
the vulnerability score um, in some other metadata. Uh, yeah, that's uh, about it. And so, as I said, the whole list. So for Linux, we have a thousand uh, CVEs. Um, I mentioned all of this. Uh, the limitations are mostly the same as build roots, uh, but just and, and for the same reason. So it was created mostly for maintainer and less so for for a user that wants to track after a release. Um, it, what is a bit worse is that vulnerabilities are generated as part of the build. So you really have to do a full build to get a vulnerability uh, list. Um, and you need all the layers again. Uh, the exclusions are in the source code again. Um, the advantage, I mean, compared to build roots, you do have the, the vulnerability uh, score. Um, so that's an, an advantage of the Octo approach. And yeah, also because the, uh, the version matching in uh, Octo is not done with the CPE database, it's actually a little simpler. You need additional tooling, but you also, in, in reality, you also need additional tooling in build roots. So I uh, gave a lot of disadvantages. Um, so I wanted to see if there's something better. Um, and we have this software bill of materials. So I checked if that was usable to uh, track vulnerabilities. It makes a lot more sense because um, you can generate the, the SBOM at build time. And then after the release, you can just use that SBOM to check if there are vulnerabilities. Um, there's also a, a Google security blog that explains why this is a good idea. Um, and it refers to two tools that can be used to do this, to, from a, an SPDX SBOM, get a list of vulnerabilities. Uh, fortunately, uh, uh, yeah, maybe I should first mention what OSV is. Uh, I'm running out of time, so this will be very quick. It's basically an alternative to the CVE database that tries to solve the issues that the CVE and CPE databases have. Um, so it will accurately track the upstreams if it actually links to the source or links to the release tarball. It also has um, version matching that works, so you can you can use git commits to do version matching, and it will look in the git history to see which uh, w whether a specific uh, uh, git hash is vulnerable. Um, and then the, uh, to make it easier to add vulnerabilities uh, with less administration, they define ecosystems and each ecosystem manages their own vulnerabilities. So you have ecosystems like PyPy and PM, etc. Um, you also have distro ecosystems, Alpine, Alma, Linux, Debian, and then you have OSS first, so completely different ecosystem that takes packages from everywhere. Um, Unfortunately, each of these ecosystems have their own way of identifying packages. They're compatible with each other, but uh, yeah, not necessarily. <laughs> uh, and then they have a lot of tooling to, to work with this. <coughs> Unfortunately, the existing tooling doesn't work. Um, why doesn't it work? Well, for BuildRoot, BuildRoot currently doesn't generate an SPDX uh, SBOM. And then the one that Yocto generates is not compatible with what the, the two tools exist. Uh, basically, uh, it's very simple. Yocto generates something with a CPE, but the OSV tools don't use the CPE identifier, so that part is useless. And then you only have the, the name and version info, and the two existing tools don't look at those fields, they look at different fields. It's fixable, uh, it just doesn't work out of the box. So I ended up not using that, so I can't say much more about this. Uh, there are are a number of other theoretical problems with OSV. Um, so I mentioned already you have uh, these different uh, ecosystems um, which are responsible for, for uh, adding the vulnerabilities and the result is that you don't have all vulnerabilities in OSV. So in, uh, I did some numbers in uh, CVE, you have 31,000 CVEs and in the Debian ecosystem, for instance, you have only 9,000 uh, uh, OSVs. Of course, CVEs are for everything, including... Uh, um, sorry, you have 31,000 CVEs which are tracked on Debian.org. Yeah, so these are things which apply to Debian, but still only 9,000 of them uh, are in the OSV database. Um, 
I, most likely that's because they are they don't put uh, CVEs which don't apply to Debian because it's a different version. Uh, they will put them in security tracker .debian.org, but not in the OSV. Um, a second problem is with these ecosystems that uh, the same problem uh, is going to be registered in different ecosystems. So, so we have the the, the embed TLS uh, CVE that I showed earlier has three different numbers in three different ecosystems uh, on on uh, on OSV. Um, and then each ecosystem has their own package identification scheme. Uh, if you filter on package name, it more or less matches, but sometimes the package name can just be different, like libcurl in one uh, ecosystem and curl in another. So it's not ideal. Um, and maybe in practice it's not so bad, but I have not really evaluated it. So um, you need to do CVE tracking, and uh, Buildroot and uh, Yocto have the tooling for that. Um, it's not perfect, but it works. Um, you do need to add some process on top of that to actually use it. And um, uh, this could become better if we could use OSV. Um, but yeah, the tooling is not there yet. And it would require some effort to get that tooling to work. And I have time for questions. On. Ah. Um, what's the state with kernel vulnerabilities? As far as I know, the Linux kernel considers every bucket potential security issue, but then CVEs are only filed by downstream projects, as far as I know. So, uh, correct? Um, anybody can, in, well, not anybody, but uh, a large number of people are able to uh, file CVEs for the kernel. And so you do have a lot of CVEs for the kernel, but it doesn't mean that something which is not mentioned in CVE uh, is not a vulnerability. So yes, you have this thing that uh, maybe the uh, CVE tracking of the kernel is not that useful. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, have you any experiences or advices how often um, the devices should be updated in the field, especially in embedded fields? They are uh, far outside in the uh, wild west used, and then it's often hard to update in the field. It's something that you need to evaluate. So if you if you look at the CVEs and you start evaluating them, then actually in practice it's rarely really applicable i mean uh, of very very often what you have is that it, um, an, um, a vulnerability could be used by an attacker but not on its own you also always need to stack several vulnerabilities to reach anywhere um, and so in in the sense that it could be used somehow it needs to be fixed eventually but there's no it's not that urgent um, and also, it depends uh, on, on how uh, exposed your product is. Um, like a an, an home gateway router is much more exposed than, than an, a, a smart uh, lamp, uh, because the smart lamp is typically after, uh, behind a nut and, and stuff anyway. Uh, so you really have to evaluate uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. OK, thanks. Hi. Um, is there a way to match the OSV database with the CPE database or, or the CVE database so that you can kind of um, cross-reference them and get a git commit anyway uh, for, a C, uh, for a CVE? Um, sometimes. <laughs> so in the uh, in this case, this one, yeah, you see already it's the CVE number, so that's an easy match. This one. Uh, there is an aliases field in the database, and it mentions the CVE number in the alias field, so that's also easy. This one just mentions the CVE. Well, actually, it's a it's an um, 
a bunch of uh, CVEs which are in a single security update. And so uh, Debian only puts the security updates in there. So there can be multiple vulnerabilities fixed in a single security update. And so that is not mentioned in aliases, but it's just mentioned in a text. Fix a CVE, blah, and blah, and blah. So that one is a bit more difficult to find. But uh, OSV has a really good search function. So if you search for that string, it will actually find it in that case. Possibly there were others as well with the same CVE, and I didn't find them uh, because I just used that search function. But um, I'm not sure if how, how useful it would be to do that because, okay, you could cross-reference each CVE to the OSV database, but then if it's not in there, you still don't know much. I mean, it could be something that is not applicable at all, so maybe use a microphone. Uh, I have the microphone here. I have also a question. Uh, okay. In a talk earlier this week, I've heard that the NIST server will be down by September. Is there a valuable solution really? for Yocto then? I, I wasn't aware that the NIST uh, server was going down. Uh, ap apparently, they are changing the format. <laughs> right, so we are well aware and we already fixed that by uh, defaulting to the new format. So it will work as long as you are with supported uh, Yocto branch. It's new information for me, so I will use that in build routes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, if there aren't any other questions, uh, thank you, Anand, for the talk. Thank you. Thank you.